Support for LAist comes from the New Yorker's Oscar-nominated documentary short Stranger at the Gate from Nobel laureate Malala. A refugee community in Indiana confronts a U.S. Marine who sought to kill them and the events that changed them all, now streaming on YouTube. I'm Tracy Thomas, host of One for the Books, a live literary event series from LAist. Join me, bachelorette and author Rachel Lindsay, and comedian and writer Chelsea Devontes for a night of book talk, games, and fun. March 22nd at the Crawford Family Forum. Tickets at laist.com slash events. LAist Studios. It's been pretty cold lately, but spring's going to be here before you know it. Less than three weeks away. What? And you know what that means. It's time to be outside. From Elias Studios, this is How to LA. I'm Brian De Los Santos. So one thing that I love to do outdoors is eat. For me, there's nothing like dining al fresco on a warm day in LA. The sights of the city all around, a cool breeze, maybe a drink, and definitely the sun. And there are a lot of places to do this all over the region. Remember back in 2020, during peak pandemic times, when so many restaurants made patios out of parking lots in order to serve people and stay in business? The thing is, a lot of those outside spaces could go away because of a proposed city ordinance. If it goes through, restaurants will have to reapply for those outdoor dining permits. And that is going to be expensive. Business owners could see extra costs worth tens of thousands. Damn. I felt like there was a kind of complete reimagining of the city landscape from these parklet spaces that we didn't really see before. So to talk about this, we've got my homie, Elias food editor, Gob Shabran. What's up, Gob? What's up, Brian? How are you? Good, good. I'm ready to, you know, eat and have a few drinks al fresco this spring. How about you? Oh, yeah, I'm super ready. But this news, it kind of gets me thinking, are people going to be able to do that come spring? Well, it all kind of depends on what the business owners and the cities decide to come up with. Okay, so before we get to all of that news about the ordinance, remind us the backstory. What did restaurants do to hustle during the pandemic to stay afloat? So during the pandemic, basically, the cities and restaurants work together to create these outdoor dining spaces. A lot of the times they're called parklets because they utilized a couple of parking spaces in front of the businesses. The ones you see on Sunset Boulevard in Echo Park in Silver Lake or uh, on Main Street in Santa Monica, just to name a few places. What happened on the city side is they ended up waiving a lot of the red tape and fees needed to usually build these outdoor parklets. And so now what's happening is the cities are now reverting back to the standards before and are looking at implementing more fees and more red tape in order to keep a permanent parklet. And I know that the city kind of helped get this going because people, you know, were suffering, obviously, through health, but also through business times. How did the city actually step in to help these businesses? It was a lot of waiving fees. Some businesses were only given like 24 hours in in certain places if they wanted to participate in the program or not. So it was a very sort of quick moving process where not too much oversight was involved in those cases. And I know like us, people who went to go to these restaurants and enjoy the food at these parklets or these outdoor patios, We kind of didn't know the ins and outs, right? But there are different ordinances for different cities. There's the city of Long Beach. There's Santa Monica. Do you know kind of know what happened across the region? So the ordinance that you were just discussing that Los Angeles is currently reviewing, they held a public hearing a couple weeks ago to get people to really kind of voice what they'd like to see happen to the program in its current state. They haven't made any decisions yet. But what is assumed is that, you know, there's going to be a lot of fees and extra red tape, and it could take up to a year in order for the entire thing to get finalized, to have a permanent parklet space. But it's different. There's the city of LA, but then also smaller cities too, Santa Monica, Long Beach, are also going through similar processes. And they're all different with their own nuances uh, as far as that goes. And you spoke to restaurant owners. 
What did they tell you of like what they're thinking about and how this impacts them? Girl, it's it's tough out there right now is basically what they told me. They have been trying to basically put together these parklets through piecemeal process. What started out as temporary, in some cases, were added on to to become permanent, like uh, the restaurant in Santa Monica, Crudo y Nudo. Basically, they kept adding to the existing structure in order to make it permanent. Gusto Bread in my town of Long Beach actually had a temporary parklet, which they had to take down completely. So it went away for a second and then they built a permanent one. I wonder, like, as we talk about this, I'm just thinking of anyone's done like kind of a, I don't know how to say it other than like illegal parklets. Have you heard of any places where like, I'm just going to do this like vigilante style? (laughs) (laughs) I think there was probably some of that, but you know, there is a lot of fees involved and everything like that. If you're going the parklet route, you have to rent these spaces. So there was still some oversight in the process because they had to, you know, get equipment like barriers, you know, to make sure that it's traffic safe and hire engineers to monitor the traffic and all of those things. So that's a big part of it. A lot of folks, and I consider myself part of this too, got really comfortable with these alfresco dining spaces. I want to go back to the fees and what the restaurant owners are facing What are some of those fees? We said at the top of the show, like it could be tens of thousands. A lot. They're paying rent for the parking spaces because they're renting from the city. They have to be up to code. There's like fire safety involved in all of that too. And then in some cases, like in the city of Santa Monica, they were being asked to pay what's called a capital wastewater fee. So a capital wastewater. (laughs) I'm like, what is that? (laughs) So a capital wastewater fee is typically something that's reserved for developers. So let's say you own a bit of land, right? And a mini mart was there originally, but now you want to build a hotel, right? And so basically what that means is that since they technically are increasing use of water and sewage, then you will be charged by the foot, basically. Okay. Of <laughs> this sounds a little confusing, Gov. I'm not going to lie. I, I agree. And so some of these restaurants are taking issue with the fact that they're having to pay for these, these fees, essentially. So in the case in, in Santa Monica, they've been actively butting heads with the Santa Monica City Council and trying to find a way around these fees. The city of Santa Monica is trying to work with them by developing a payment plan, but these are high fees. Aside from the construction itself, I mean, we're looking at somewhere even in like the sixty, seventy thousand dollars, you know, and these are businesses that have already struggling, you know, uh, throughout the pandemic. So, how about those folks in the city of LA? I believe I read on your story that there is a, a way to contact. Is it the committee or or someone that is like planning looking- commission? You yeah. can reach out to the planning commission and share your thoughts. Each and every city is going through a version of this right now. So if it's happening near you and it's something that you want to stay as part of the landscape, you should let your voice be heard. I think we all became more aware of space, you know, because of social distancing and all of that. And that had an effect not just on ourselves, but also the area around us too. As a result, Businesses change, restaurants change, how we get food changed. All of these things change. What these restaurants are essentially looking for is to make a note of that change instead of kind of going back to just how it was before, which is basically what the city are doing. They just want to go back to business as usual. In some cases, you could say there is no going back. This is kind of the brave new world. All right, God, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. Okay, that's it for us today. We'll be back tomorrow to talk about something that's real close to my heart. So make sure to listen then. If you like this pod, please subscribe. And if you love this pod, check out our newsletter and subscribe there as well. Tell your friends to do the same. Check us out on elias.com slash how to LA. It really helps us out. Thanks for hanging out with us and adios. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. 
Support for LAist comes from The New Yorker, presenting Stranger at the Gate, the Oscar-nominated documentary short from the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Malala about a Marine who plots to bomb an Indiana mosque but is forever changed by the Afghan refugees he wanted to kill. Stranger at the Gate won a top prize at Tribeca, was a nominee for the Critics' Choice Documentary Awards, and is the Washington Post's critic pick. Now in theaters, Oscar nominee Stranger at the Gate is streaming on YouTube.